three weeks a year looking at and thinking about submarine cables. It's a side project to what I really do, which is mainly network engineering and radio engineering. Uh, and um, when I uh, sold out of my uh, previous carrier that I built in 2011, I said, I want to do some new things, and the Internet of Things is new. And so I went full in looking at and working with the Internet of Things, got involved in some network technologies that failed, invested in um, IoT startup that failed, uh, and um, generally experienced a lot of failure um, up uh, from 2011 to 2015 when I um, was taken advantage of by a friend and colleague who um, was uh, thinking, well, maybe now we won't fail. And he started a business in New Zealand uh, operating a LoRaWAN network, and LoRaWAN is one of the technologies that we'll talk about. So since 2015, I have been the network and radio designer and network and radio operator for a um, IoT network in New Zealand that has, I don't know, 30 or so base stations in New Zealand and about 75% population coverage. And uh, we just helped Blue Sky Cook Islands uh, build another seven base stations uh, on Rarotonga. Um, and those have been up and running for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we've got a base station um, and project in Indonesia also. So um, I have a bit of experience with IoT, and I spend maybe a quarter of my time uh, doing it. Uh, the whole idea of the Internet of Things, this phrase that is so common in language today, has only been around for nine years. Uh, and it first came from Kevin Ashton in the RFID Journal. And this concept, uh, he wrote an essay. Uh, and part of that essay is, we need to empower computers with their own means of gathering information so they can see, hear, and smell the world for themselves in all its random glory. Now, connected refrigerators and light bulbs are not really seeing or smelling the world in all its random glory, but um, there are some very, very wonderful things. So the Internet of Things... Oh, I have no speaker notes. This is going to be a, an adventure. The Internet of Things is very, very small. Small microprocessors, small sensors, small amounts of memory, small messages, small antennas, and small wireless transactions. You think about a Wi-Fi connected light bulb, there's really nothing small about that because Wi-Fi isn't small. Wi-Fi doesn't use small amounts of energy. Uh, it usually doesn't send small wireless transactions. Wi-Fi is a very chatty protocol. Uh, and um, you usually have a relatively decent sized microprocessor for something that's on Wi-Fi. So things different from Wi-Fi are out there in the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is tiny. Look how many chips we've got on there. But it's also big. Your microwave, seriously, washer, dryer, dishwasher, coffee maker, refrigerator, VCR television, these things are all now connected to the IoT. Garage door openers, sprinkler systems, phones, answering machines, uh, APNIX general counsel. Uh, Craig last night was uh, showing me video of his house in Melbourne uh, from various angles through a cloud platform on his phone, and he does consider this to be an Internet of Things application. I said, Craig, there's no view of the bedroom. <laughs> anyway, we were having fun last night. Uh, this is the cliche of the Internet of Things, the connected refrigerator, and um, especially when newspapers and TV programs say, oh, this is the next thing, the Internet of Things, they say, oh, refrigerator, everybody knows what that is. What can you do with your refrigerator? Well, your refrigerator can know what you put in and can know what you take out. Plenty of seats up here. Come on, you know, fill in, don't stand for 90 minutes. Uh, except, Save, you're allowed to leave. You've probably heard this one before. <laughs> um, the cliche of the connected fridge is that will, it will tell you when you're running low on milk. It will know because you know, you've put it in, you've taken it out so many times. Uh, maybe it knows the weight of the um, milk because the uh, shelf has some sensors in it. It can order more food for you. Now that's really useful. If I had a barcode scanner on the front of my refrigerator, uh, I honestly, when I used up a container of yogurt, would just scan it, and I would love that yogurt to be back in my fridge tomorrow without me having to do anything. And that is a real possibility for the future in developed markets very, very soon. Um, already there's a service uh, from Amazon 
where you can give them access to your house so they can put things in your refrigerator for you. Uh, this is kind of crazy, but hey, why not? Um, I, uh, I got a worried call from one of my um, tenants from a, a house I rent last year, and she said, we're stuck in Tauranga, and the groceries are being delivered at 7 p.m. tonight. Can you please take them in for us? And absolutely, I went, oh, I've unlocked their place. I put their groceries away in the fridge. You know, why not? A little bit more manual than it should be. But um, so the cliche of the connected fridge is that it's going to do everything, and it's going to know how healthy you are. Um, it is a cliche, but this is the reality. This is an industrial refrigerator. And industrial refrigerators, in some markets, it is useful to have IoT instrumentation today, not just useful, but financially viable. Um, because in New Zealand, for example, as a food handler and a food seller, you must maintain a record book of the temperature of your food the entire time you have it, from production through distribution, storage, and sale. All of your refrigerators need to have logbooks, and you need to take the temperature of them once a day and record it in the logbook to make sure that uh, you haven't spoiled your food. Well, guess what? This is an administrative overhead, and when you have a situation like a grocery store with tens or hundreds of refrigerators, instrumenting these refrigerators with temperature and humidity monitors is cheaper than sending someone around to look at a temperature gauge and write it down in a book every day. Now, this is a heater, okay? Um, we don't have heaters in New Caledonia, I don't think. This is winter, right? Winter? Yeah, this is, this is winter. It doesn't get cold enough, but certainly in New Zealand, we do have heaters, and they're a major use of electricity and gas. Um, they're very uneconomic and very unscientific to use. I remember living in Poland 20 years ago, and the heat was on a per city basis. They'd have the heat generated out of town, piped in via steam pipes, and everyone would have radiators, just like this one on the wall. There was no controls on them, and when people got too hot, they just opened the window. Can we do better with IoT, with heaters? I mean, the biggest problem is that in a room like this, there's gonna be one temperature sensor at the thermostat. It's gonna be on the wall, and it's going to say, hey, this is the temperature right here and right now in this one place. And the rest of the room is going to be a completely different temperature. Can we do better with IoT? Well, it turns out that this thing has been replaced by, oops, I don't have a slide for it, a thing called a Nest IoT thermostat. And the Nest IoT thermostat has the ability to have multiple sensors in multiple rooms and it will learn your behavior. It will learn when you're typically in the house, when you want it warmer, when you want it cooler, because you just train it by pressing the buttons a few times, and then it will decide, well, hey, maybe I can turn the heat down at night, maybe I can turn it up in the morning, maybe the house is empty by 10 o'clock in the morning because everyone's gone to work. I will do everything I can to save energy. And this was such a good idea. Well, not just save energy, but save energy and keep the house comfortable. People love their Nest thermostats because they work really well. And they worked so well that uh, three, four years ago now, Google acquired the Nest company for a billion dollars. Billion dollar idea, pretty darn good. Now these are uh, gas meters. And gas meters and water meters are a very hard problem. You see this is in a dark alley I mean, this photograph has nice light in it, but mostly they're in dark alleys. Sometimes they're even below ground. In Australia, water meters are usually in the earth, in your front yard, under a plastic cover so that you don't see them. And once a month or once every three months or once a year, someone will come around and read the water meter so that they can send you a bill. Electronic metering for power has been a thing for 10 years because it's expensive to send people around to read meters. But power meters have this feature that gas and water meters don't have, and it's power. Power meters have power at them, sort of inherently. Uh, gas meters, water meters, there's no electricity here. And there's typically no sunlight here. So you don't have the ability to charge a solar panel. Power meters usually work on cellular, which is a very energy-intensive 
uh, activity, even spinning a cellular modem up once a day to send a message that might take two seconds, you use a heap of power in a cellular transaction your phone has to, or your module has to join the network. There's back and forth communication maybe 20 different times before you can send your first byte of data. And then it shuts down the transaction. And if you try to do this every day um, on a battery, you're going to have to replace that battery once a year. Now, we have new IoT protocols designed for metering. You can put a battery in, and they can send a transaction every hour for 10 years. Really, really special stuff. OK, so mechanical meters have no power. They frequently have no sunlight. They're hard for humans to read and maintain. New batteries and new wireless solutions, uh, in particular IoT wireless solutions, solve these problems. Now, this is a different sort of power application. These are transformers. Uh, and power companies put transformers in, and they last for 20 years or 25 years, and then they get replaced. Power companies don't usually know when these things are going to fail. They just say, well, typically after 25 years, the components inside have broken down, and it's time to replace it before it explodes. And they actually do explode. If you leave them too long and they degrade, they'll go bang. Um, what can you do? to use one of these things as long as possible because they cost thousands of dollars. If you're a power company and you want to extend the life of this $5,000 asset, you want to extend it a couple of years, put a $100 temperature monitor on it and send information to your monitoring platform every hour. And guess what? You can save a lot of money in maintenance and repairs just by knowing what the temperature of these is. Because when you start to see it trend upwards, then you know, hey, it's time to replace it. I've got two weeks left. I've got a month left before it's going to go bang. Let's get the use out of it, replace it, instead of just saying, right, we're going to replace all the transformers in this neighborhood or this city this month or this year. So IoT for infrastructure, it is definitely not just for automated meter reading. Um, if you leave a transformer uh, in too long, it will go bang. If you take it out too early, you lose money and useful life out of it. So you monitor the temperature and voltages uh, with IoT devices. Really not something that you could have done easily um, five years ago, 10 years ago, but something you can do very easily now. Uh, this is a mousetrap, and this is a real thing, uh, because in grocery stores like this in the UK, there is a law that says you must check your rodent traps every 24 hours. Or more specifically, your rodent traps may not have a rodent in them dead for more than 24 hours. So supermarkets like Sainsbury or whatever UK things they have, they probably have Carrefour in the UK too, um, send somebody around with a stick, with a mirror on the end of the stick, and they walk around poking the stick underneath here, looking at the rat traps to see if there's a dead mouse or a dead rat. And that takes a lot of time and energy on the part of the store employees. And it happens that five years ago already, there was a partnership between Newell, who have since been purchased by Huawei, and Rent-A-Kill, a pest control uh, agency, um, with an IoT mousetrap. And now there are a number of IoT mousetraps on the market. They just have to have enough energy to send a beacon once a day that says, hey, I'm empty, I'm empty, or hey, I've been triggered, come and pick me up. This happens not only in store environments, but in New Zealand, we have uh, traps for uh, mammals, really. We're not supposed to have mammals in New Zealand. So we have traps for mice, rats, hedgehogs, stoats, uh, possums, brush-tailed possums imported from Australia because these things prey on our native birds. Now the other thing we have in New Zealand are pigs and goats. And if you kill a rat or a rabbit or a stoat and you leave it in the trap for a day or two, guess what? The goats or the pigs are going to come and eat it and then they're just going to have more babies and you're just causing different problems in different places. So we have traps now that will send a message back and say, hey, um, you've got a dead animal here to clear. It's time to reset your trap, clear your traps. That saves a lot of time because without these, they dip once a week. Trash can, um, okay, this really seems ridiculous, but in 
developed markets, um, UK especially, it's very expensive to send people around to check the trash cans. If you know it's full, you can clear it. If you know when your trash cans are getting full, you can plan the route of a garbage truck so that he goes by in the, in the most efficient way to use the least amount of time and the least amount of diesel fuel. There are sensors to alert cities about full trash cans. These are street lights. You cannot check whether a street light is working in the daytime without climbing up top and putting your hand over the light sensor that says, hey, it's time to turn on. And in, so, in some cases, street lights are automatically activated from a central point. And in that case, yeah, you could turn them all on and have somebody go around and check them. That's a lot of work. Or you can wait until enough street lights fail in a place and people report to you the street lights have failed. Or you can put a sensor into your light bulb that says, hey, it's generating light, it's consuming electricity, everything is good, or it has stopped generating light, it is no longer consuming electricity, it's time to replace it. Very inexpensive to add a sensor, an IoT sensor, to one of these street lights, which are quite expensive devices, they're thousands of dollars each, so you don't notice the extra five dollars you spent on a microprocessor and a sensor. Um, very, very inexpensive technology for street lights. This is a car park. Now, again, it seems like a first world problem, but um, car parks, not having a good knowledge of how car parks are functioning is a huge problem for congestion. Most, but 30 or 40 in Singapore, they've got digital 300 space. Uh, Who knows? Timber, milk powder, get hot. Is it okay? Careful, does he have to be setting it down on the truck? He's loading it on a truck now. Add a battery good enough for running this for a couple of weeks, maybe another 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Batteries are very expensive. They're one of the most expensive parts of the IoT. So, you can give customers and shippers assurance of proper shipping of their goods um, with IoT sensors. Right, IoT for tracking containers. Where is your container? Uh, I, um, in Wellington, have ordered uh, things from China in containers, in particular antennas. I never have any idea where they are, where they've been delayed. Sometimes they get delayed in China waiting for a ship. Sometimes they get delayed in transshipment because China to New Zealand containers typically stop in Australia first. Sometimes they get held up in Wellington waiting to clear customs. I have no idea. The shipping companies, well, I mean, I use Chinese logistics companies, so they're responsive sometimes and um, in English not very good and I don't speak Chinese or read Chinese well enough. It's Google Translate. So having an IoT sensor that tells you um, where your container is, this used to be thousands of dollars and today you can do this with a less than $100. The light is down to $200. Something that will send a ping to even as an experimenter, as somebody, a hobbyist, you can buy these parts over the internet. Uh, hobby stores now in Australia and New Zealand. Certainly in Thailand, I saw them being sold uh, on the shelf in Bangkok. Uh, Hong Kong, of course, easy, super easy. Right, this is a lighthouse, and you know how we were talking about um, checking the street lights? Yeah, checking the street lights, okay, somebody's got to drive around at night looking to see if they're working. These things are a lot harder. And one of my customers in New Zealand is the harbor master of Picton. Picton controls the ferries that go between the North and South Island on their most <laughs> difficult route through sunken islands and, um, and rough, a rough passage. So we have 70 some different lights. One of the projects that I have now is instrumenting these lights to know whether or not they're working. This is a bit harder than street lights because street lights always have cell phone connectivity. They even usually put mesh networks in to handle them because there's so many. These are way out in the middle of nowhere. There's no cell phone. Getting connectivity to them is very hard. So you need a very special radio protocol that goes a very long distance to be able to keep track of them. 
uh, other things that we're doing with IoT uh, for maritime safety, weather data, tide height, tsunami warning. Uh, in October, I'm going to be helping with a new buoy uh, sitting out in the Cook Strait that measures all of these conditions and sends them via a very long radio link back to the internet for real-time processing. This is a pivot irrigator. If you've ever flown across the United States from, uh, say, California to New York City or across Canada, you will look down and you're going to see circles. Irrigators in Samoa. So, and as a result, the entire gives water to the wheat and soybean crops of America is running out. Within 15 years, there will be no more water to irrigate in the Midwest. What are the solutions for this? There are now pivot irrigators, one in fact made in New Zealand, that have a set of sensors on them. They have infrared cameras on the irrigator that finds what is the state of the um, crops. You can also, instead of doing that, send a drone over, and the drone can use its cameras to see where is it dry. Where are the leaves turning brown? Where do we need the water? These guys now, um, the one from New Zealand is called like Veriflow. They have variable flow meters in the sprinklers, and they know where they are. And as they go across, they say more water here, less water here, no water here, all the water here. As they move across the field, they put the water where the water needs to be. Right, a little bit harder to do it here with drip irrigation, but when you get to places like the Middle East and Israel in particular, they're doing drip irrigation uh, regulated down to the crop row. Uh, because they need to, because water is that precious of a commodity. And uh, in some cases, they're desalinizing it, taking seawater, taking the salt out, and then they're using it for irrigation. You don't waste water when you have to take it out of the ocean and use energy to make it into fresh water. New moisture sensors will enable really high-level detail of what's going on with your soil. If we step back, traditional moisture sensors now uh, look like a fork with two prongs. You stick them in the ground, and they send electricity between the two prongs. And if the soil is wet, the wetter it is, the more conductive it's going to be. So you'll get more electricity. And if it's very dry, you'll get very little. This is an OK way of measuring soil moisture, but it's very energy intensive. Not very good for using batteries, because you're just wasting energy doing it. There's a new type of sensor. I hope I have a picture of it next. Do I? No, I have a picture of it in, in one of the later slides. A new type of sensor we'll talk about later that um, solves this problem in a different way. Now, IoT for greenhouses. Greenhouses, you not only have the problem of watering, but you need to know about heat and cold, too. You don't want them to be too hot. You certainly don't want them to be too cold. When you don't want them to be too cold, this is a gas pipe. So you're taking natural gas or propane, and you're burning it. You're burning fossil fuels to keep the greenhouse warm. If you don't have to burn fossil fuels to keep the greenhouse warm, don't do it, because they're expensive. So having enough sensors in here will say, right, I need the heater on here, and I need it on for five minutes. I don't need it to be running all night. This is a farm and a water tank. And what do you do uh, when the water tank runs out? And this is way out in the outback in Australia. Well, it is part of life for many farmers to go around and check their tanks. What do they do? They climb up here. They thump on the side of the tank. Is it full? Is it not? Or climb all the way up top, look down. Is it full? Is it not? When these things run out in remote areas, these oftentimes are used to, for cattle watering. So they'll, they'll have a pool down here where the cattle come and drink if they don't get enough moisture from the uh, grass they're feeding on. When they run out, if they're out in the middle of nowhere and no one knows, the cows will get sick and die. They will actually die of dehydration. So people are very careful with this, but it takes a lot of time and energy to check them. You can use an ultrasonic sensor now that costs $10 to check what is the level. You stick the sensor 
on the top, it generates a bit of a sound wave, pings down, pings back up, and you measure the delay and you say, right, I have one meter, two meters, three meters of space between the top of the tank and the bottom of the tank, and that means or the, where the water level is, so I've got this much water. I've got this much water, and it's declining at this rate, so every day I'm going down by this much. So I know that in three days I'm going to be out, in two weeks I'm going to be out, I need to send a truck to fill it up, I'm not replenishing because the pump is broken, there's something wrong. Yeah, when I wrote this, it was less than $100 for a tank monitor with solar and 3G, less than 200 for a tank monitor with solar and satellite. Uh, those prices have gone down. Uh, look in this picture, there are water tanks everywhere. The implications of knowing what is in all of these tanks are huge. Cities in South Asia now, especially in times of water crisis, will often supply water for only a day a week, sometimes only a few hours a week. They don't have enough water to pressurize their entire water network. So they're going to say, this neighborhood is going to have water at this time. Then when that happens, everybody turns on electric pumps, pumps the water up into their tanks on their roof. I've experienced this in Nepal. And you think, Kathmandu, they should have plenty of water. That part of Nepal should have plenty of water, and they don't. They don't have enough. Um, as a city or as a water provider, if you can know what's in all of the tanks, uh, you have a very good idea of where you need to supply water and when you need to supply it. You can do it very inexpensively now. Uh, there's some other IoT applications around water. Next drop in India uh, connects the people controlling the water networks with people in the neighborhoods via a text message system so that uh, people in the neighborhoods will know ahead of time when the water is going to be turned on so they can go fill their bathtubs and fill their buckets uh, so they can have water for the rest of the week. Water tanks. What happens when you run out of water? Water tanks come to supply individual houses and cities and neighborhoods. I've been staying in the Philippines the last few months. There are water tanks that come around to the barangay to fill people up every once in a while. If a water tanker knows where it needs to go because it has levels on the tanks it's going to fill, it can optimize its delivery schedule, its delivery route. It can get there faster in the right amount of time, use the least amount of fuel and the least amount of driver time to get the job done. Uh, sometimes we have too much water. Uh, there are a lot. This is, this is Bangkok um, in, I want to say, 20... 12 or so, 2013, was this about when the Bangkok floods were? I, I've been to um, a few places in Bangkok where there are still marks on the walls from where how high the water got and was sitting there for a couple of months. Um, there are a lot of neat things you can do uh, with um, these sensors to not just predict when there'll be a flood, but um, figure out how everything's working in terms of the hydrodynamics of the streams and where the water is, is getting up. So Project NOAA in the Philippines has made and deployed over 1,000 IoT-based weather stations. Weather stations used to cost thousands of dollars each. And the weather stations that I put in for the Harbor Master in Picton, they are actually 2500 US dollars each. Project NOAA has made their own weather stations in the low hundreds of dollars each, and they have deployed them around the country. They know before floods are going to come. They know before a mudslide is going to happen because they have sensors, vibration sensors in hills. Uh, they have vibration sensors on bridges. They have those ultrasonic level sensors for the water heights uh, and uh, this inexpensive project has already saved lives and helped the Philippine government plan. Here's a, um, a map of this. If you just Google for Project NOAA and Philippines, you'll, you'll find it. Really neat website to interact with. Okay. That takes us through the first part, which was the applications. And now we're going to talk about sensing and actuating. And this is a technical introduction to the IoT, so this is going to be quite technical. Uh, we've got two types of sensors, analog sensors or digital sensors. Um, their accuracy often varies with how much you pay for them. 
Um, sometimes these sensors are good right away. Sometimes they need to calibrate, they need to warm up. Um, the power requirements of these sensors vary immensely. Uh, you can have a, a light sensor, and it doesn't need any power. It, it just gets, you know, it, it says, hey, I've got light. You can have a gas sensor, and the gas sensor may need to heat up the gas to a particular temperature before it can measure it so that it's calibrated. Um, if you use really cheap sensors, no, is in some applications, wrong data can be worse than no data at all. But also, if you use a lot of inexpensive sensors and you know these sensors are accurate to a particular degree, having lots and lots of less accurate samples can be just as good as having, or better, than having one very accurate sample. So, an accelerometer. I, I'm just going <coughs> to click through all of these. Tells you up, down, left, right um, how fast you're accelerating. Air quality sensors. Uh, in particular, PM 2.5, this is a measurement for particulate matter of a size, and particulate matter of a particular size is very dangerous to breathe in. Uh, the lifespans of people in India, in some cities in Russia, um, China, of course, is a great example. Lifespans of people are down by years because of particulate matter in the air, mostly from burning of coal and diesel fuel. Alcohol sensors, breathalyzer. That would have been a good thing to have last night. <laughs> Barometric pressure. You think, oh, who needs a barometer? But everyone in this room has a barometer. I'm dead serious. You all have barometers with you. They're built into your cell phones because barometers can be used to measure altitude. And altitude is incredibly important for GPS positioning. So all of your phones now have, in addition to a GPS, they have a barometer so that you can more accurately be placed on a map for location services. Cameras, we all have cameras everywhere. Collision sensor, this one's really cool. You put it on a robot, the robot runs into a wall, it says, oops, it just triggers a sensor. Um, I've had a robot vacuum cleaner for... Uh, 16 or 17 years, I bought the first Roomba when I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, the iRobot people were just down the street. I thought this is the coolest thing on the planet. It's a terrible vacuum cleaner because it's just got a bunch of uh, collision sensors in it. It just runs around, zzz, clunk, then it turns and it goes, zzz, clunk, turns around and yeah. Color sensor. Okay, what do you do with a color sensor? Put it on a production line in a fruit packing house. If you see a banana that's black, pff, turn it into puree. If you see an apple that's not the right color, do something else with it, push it off the line. These things can work very, very quickly. They can be better than the human eye because they're much faster. Digital compass, which way are we pointing? I didn't even know, I think, I feel like north is that way, but who knows? My compass could probably tell me. Formaldehyde, uh, especially in South Asia, when you have clothing manufacture, formaldehyde is a big deal because formaldehyde is used in the production of cloth and coloring in industrial processes. You get a huge stack of cloth, you bring it into a closed room, maybe has a couple of fans with 30 or 40 or 50 people in sewing machines. The levels of formaldehyde in the air build up, people will get very sick. Having a formaldehyde sensor, which is cheap, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, can tell you, hey, we need to turn the fans on. Okay, everybody, uh, get out of here for 10 minutes while we air the place out because this new load of fabric is really stinky and is really bad for us. Galvanic skin response. Uh, this, um, it, like the conductivity of the soil, will send a little bit of uh, electricity and determine, you can um, find out if somebody's sweaty, if they're nervous um, with one of these things. Very, very cheap now. Gas sensors, same as formaldehyde. Um, the smoke alarms that I have in my flats now in the kitchen have carbon monoxide sensors in addition to smoke detectors because they're gas stoves in the, um, uh, in, in the kitchens, and I want to know, is there carbon monoxide? GPS, well, this is our location. Used to be GPS was just a set of satellites from the US. 
Now we have GPS receivers that will pick up US satellites, they'll pick up Russian satellites, they'll pick up European satellites, they'll pick up Chinese satellites. There are a number of different competing GPS systems and those idiots in the UK are thinking, well, since we're leaving the European Union, we gotta launch our own positioning satellite network. Just last week I, I read this, I, oh my god, really? Electrical current sensor. This is cool. You stick a um, you stick a wire uh, through here, and it measures the current uh, that's going through the wire. Uh, this is as good as a power meter for many applications. In fact, it is a power meter, and it's very very cheap dollars for one of these things. Do you need to know how much power a light is drawing, a motor, a fan? Do you need to know if a motor or a fan is on? Put a current sensor on it. If the motor stops, the current will stop. Flow sensor. Uh, in irrigation systems, this one uh, probably just works on Hall effect. Um, the sensors in here goes around in a circle. You know how fast it's going. Um, what is the flow? Well, a lot of people don't care what the flow is. They just care if it's flowing or not, especially in a big farm if you're reticulating water for cattle or for irrigation. You want to know, is the water going? Is the water not going? A flow switch. Uh, this one screws into the top of a pipe, and as the water goes here, the stronger the water goes, the further back this will be bent. Force-sensitive resistor. Well, we've got a bunch of traces here, and I imagine we're sending electricity through, and the more force we push on this, uh, the, um, uh, the current will vary as it, as, it, as it goes through. I don't know if the current will, will become less as you push harder, but it allows you to control something um, by saying, right, press harder, and you get a different effect than a light tap. Gyroscope, um, kind of like the, used in conjunction with the accelerometer, uh, for positioning and determining up, down, left, right, moving. Hall sensor. So, Hall sensor is magnetic. Ulrich, you remember? Oh, yeah. Magnetic effect? Yes, Hall effect, yeah. Hall effect. So what, what, when it gets near a piece of metal or a magnet, then it closes the circuit? I've actually forgotten. Well, basically, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but yeah. Okay. Good enough, magnetic sensor. So you, you might have a, a hall sensor to measure whether um, you're, you've opened or closed a door or whether a um, magnet on a spinning uh, flow meter has gone by or on a, a mechanical meter of some sort. Uh, humidity sensor, this one's pretty cool. Uh, this one, again, is sending electricity through this trace here. And the more humidity that's in the air, Possibly the more conductive this is going to be, or it could be the less conductive, um, but it's, it's an analog sensor that, um, uh, that measures air humidity, and they're used in everything these days. Infrared, we've got a whole class of infrared uh, sensors. Um, at its most basic, you have the idea of a passive infrared sensor, which is kind of like a light sensor. It says, right, there is infrared. Um, Sometimes in rooms you'll have security systems and up in the corner you'll have a passive infrared sensor. An infrared reflection sensor is going to both generate and receive infrared light. It's going to have an infrared light bulb in it, just a little LED, and it's going to see how much infrared light is reflecting back. Uh, this is the passive sensor that you use in security monitors. Here's a light sensor. Okay, do we have light? Do we not have light? How much light do we have? Load sensor is to do with weight, so the more weight you have on it, uh, the more or less current you have going through these wires. Uh, load sensors are accurate up to, can be accurate um, for weights up to tons. Uh, one of my friends is working on an application to measure the weight of trucks in a mining uh, application. So they've instrumented concrete pads with load sensors and they're reading those uh, uh, reading those um, sensors to determine how much the truck is hauling. Loudness sensor is a bit different from a microphone. It just says, what is the intensity of a noise? Microphone, of course, is just what I'm using here. Um, can be useful for all sorts of IoT applications. The most interesting microphone IoT application has been in Barcelona for almost 10 years now. They instrument the city with microphones to determine the location of gunshots. 
microphones all over the city to determine the location of gunshots to send the police there, and crime went down as a result. It's an absolutely amazing case study. Moisture sensor, I already explained electricity across the soil. If the soil is wet, uh, it's more conductive. If the soil is dry, it's less conductive. Moisture chip is the one I was talking about earlier. This is so cool. It's got a barometer in it. And how do you determine moisture with a barometer? You put a membrane, a, a micro membrane on here that is, um, what do you call it when um, water, uh, water can, can um, come in or go out? Semi-permeable membrane, exactly. And so the more moisture that is inside of this membrane, the more pressure. So it measures, uh, measures water, moisture of soil or um, of a plant or of a leaf. This thing's tiny. It's smaller than your fingernail. It's so small you can insert it in the stem of a plant. So it measures that with a barometer, with pressure. An optical dust sensor most likely is using um, infrared or uh, light from an LED, and it's saying how much of the light is getting through. Uh, if there's a lot of dust in the air, less light's getting through. Photo interrupter, if you remember how um, uh, vending machines work, you put a coin through. Well, guess what? We've just got a little bit of light going through here, and uh, we've got current going through if there is light, and no current if there's no light. Well. Put a quarter through there, you've interrupted the um, signal. Pressure sensor, microelectric mechanical sensor, MEMS. Um, barometers are typically microelectrical mechanical sensors now. Um, little tiny machines and chips. Real time clock. Hmm, how do I explain a real time clock? A real-time clock is a very small, low-power computer that just acts as a calendar, a date, time, and, uh, and timer for turning things on and turning things off. In IoT applications that process information and send things over the airwaves with radio, these devices typically use quite a lot of power. And so what you say is, I only need this device to work for one minute once a day or one minute once an hour. It's going to have its own battery that um, takes care of its own needs, its communication needs, but I'm going to have a separate little computer called a real-time clock with a chip that's going to say, hey, main computer wake up, main computer shut down. Um, a long time ago, we all had desktop personal computers, or some of us had desktop personal computers, and eventually they would kind of stop working because the battery ran out. That was a real-time clock that kept uh, time for the computer, and that little coin cell battery we'd have to pry out and replace. Read switch. Read switch in the presence of metal or magnet. These two wires are going to come together and touch, and then current is going to flow through. Super useful. Solar radiation sensor all over uh, New Zealand. The meteorological service has solar radiation sensors so that they know a record of how much sunlight you've had and so they can predict in the future how much sunlight you will have on a particular day in a particular location. Solar panels in South Asian markets get very dusty because there's lots of dust from dirt roads and it's very hot and there's not a lot of um, rain. When solar panels are dusty, they can become incredibly inefficient. If you have a solar array, and a solar radiation sensor. What can you do? You can either go out and clean your solar array every day just in case it's dusty, or you can have a solar radiation sensor that says this is the amount of radiation I'm getting right now, and you can check the graphs of your solar array and your solar radiation sensor. Am I getting as much sunlight out of my array as I should? Well, if I'm not, I go and clean them. Solar radiation sensing for arrays is one of the reasons that Blue Sky Cook Islands has asked uh, Kotahinet, my customer, to build a uh, LoRaWAN network on their infrastructure in the Cooks. So uh, Cook Islands is dependent on solar and diesel for power. Their solar arrays now have instrumentation, IoT instrumentation, to keep them running well. Temperature sensor. This temperature sensor probably costs a few pennies. This is like a Texas Instruments Dallas um, temperature sensor on a one-wire bus. Um, 
very, very cheap, pennies. Um, so cheap that you could instrument this room with lots of them. So cheap that eventually they will just be built into walls. Uh, therm thermistor measures temperature in a different way and is good for measuring very hot things. Uh, if you've got a, an oven temperature sensor, uh, it's probably a thermistor and uh, the resistance of current through the device goes up as it gets hotter or goes down as it gets hotter. There's some, some variation in voltage depending upon the temperature of this material. Capacitive touch sensor, uh, like elevator buttons in nice um, elevators. Vibration sensor, okay. Everything vibrates, but in um, most cases, um, vibration is a sign that something's wrong. Uh, if you're on a train, if you've got a train car, the more efficient it is, the smoother it's going to be, the less vibration. The more vibration, the less efficient it's going to be. It means that something is breaking. Vibration sensors are so inexpensive that they are built into everything now. I struggle to think of how many sensors are in jet engines now, but I think tens of thousands of sensors in each jet engine. There are going to be vibration sensors all over a jet engine that are um, monitored and maintained by the supplier of the engine. In fact, it was engine telemetry data that allowed various governments to know where MH370, was it 370, the one that went off over the, yeah. Engine sensing data like vibration sensors that allowed them to track the plane after it shut off all of its other communications, the engine manufacturer still knew that it was getting pings from the engine as they were flying over the Pacific Ocean. Ultrasonic range finder, like in our water applications, it sends a ping, um, whatever the distance is comes back. Uh, you can use these not just for measuring water, but you can use them for measuring distance, um, such as in a vehicle, uh, the closer you get to a wall, well, this thing knows from the sound. Ultraviolet radiation sensor, like our light sensor, um, like our infrared sensor, measures UV. Okay, that was all the sensors. Man, I'm tired. <laughs> okay, now we're going to talk briefly about... Even my arm's getting tired. We're going to talk briefly about actuating the Internet of Things. Uh, and actuating means, you know, in actually making them do things. So when we talk about actuators, we need to think about um, voltage and amperage, about interfaces, um, accuracy and cost, availability. And with all sensors, when you're designing something, um, and all actuators, you need to see not just that it does what you want, but the documentation is good, the support is good, and that there's some community uh, around the um, device or method or chipset that you're picking. It's a buzzer, bzzz, light emitting diodes, LEDs. We use LEDs in everything. They're super fun to play with too. Relays. Relays can be used to switch current on and off. You can use a very small amount of electricity to switch on and off a much higher level of electricity, so switching lights on and off. Um, I have IoT relay applications in the harbor system. When we detect the movement of ferries in Picton Harbor, we detect this because they send a GPS ping out in a protocol called AIS. We have a computer that analyzes the position and the movement of the big ferries. When they start to move, we send to an IoT device a signal, funny enough, by HTTP that actuates a relay. The relay turns some blinking lights on. And, and so when the big ships are moving in the harbor, blue lights are flashing everywhere so that the small boats know the big ships are moving before they even see them. Servos. Servo is a motor with a very fine degree of um, control that you can turn in very fine increments. Uh, if I wanted to uh, actuate those windows, open them and close them depending upon the weather, uh, there is a building in Auckland now, uh, Grid Auckland, which is a um, co-working space uh, and has some offices in it that's a smart building. It now has servo actuated motors um, for increasing or decreasing the airflow in the building based on sensors they have all over the building. So this is a smart building that allows people to save on air conditioning and ventilation needs by automatically opening and closing the windows. 
Solenoid. Um, you'll see these in locks sometimes. Uh, this is a piston that is controlled electromagnetically. Um, in some cases, when there's no current, it fails in the, um, in the down position. In some cases, when there's no current, it fails in the up position. Uh, if you ever touch your badge to a door and you hear a click like this, that's probably a solenoid that's making that click and, and opening the lock for you. A transistor, kind of like a relay, except a little bit different, is the basis of all computers ever now uh, and allows you to switch on and off a of voltage using a very, very small amount of current. Okay, now we've talked about actuating. We're going to talk briefly on energy systems because the IoT and all of the radio protocols around the IoT um, are focused on power use. So when you think about an IoT system, you need to think about the amount of power required, whether it's a stationary or a mobile application, the robustness of the system, its physical size, the level of human interaction required. Um, I really prefer solar systems for remote applications because there's very little human interaction required, and I can leave them for a year at a time or two years without worrying that they're going to fail. And, of course, the technological maturity, because we're going to see a few things in here that are really neat and really cool, and they're definitely not technologically mature. Okay. Ambient backscatter is the least mature and the most exciting power technology ever. You are picking power up out of the air from the Wi-Fi. You're picking it up, you know, just like a solar uh, panel collects light from the sun and turns that into energy. You've got little radio antennas now, rectennas, um, that are taking power from TV broadcasts, radio broadcasts, Wi-Fi hotspots, and turning that into micro trickles of electricity that can be captured. Biomechanical. I don't... Um, I never did electrical engineering, so I have no idea what the circuit diagram says at all. Uh, but there are biomechanical power generators now for charging um, devices and cell phones, um, oftentimes with military use, um, that are part of your boots. You need your phone charged, you need your communicator, your walkie-talkie, whatever. Um, there is something in the heel that as you walk is using your weight and your energy to make some electricity. Induction. Um, all of us have induction power antennas with us right now. I'm going to take mine out. Somewhere in my PayWave MasterCard, I have an antenna that is taking power from a card reader. And in some cases, the card reader will supply an RF signal at 137 megahertz or something like VHF. Some of these cards run the Java operating system. They have microprocessors that start up when they receive power via their antenna, and they execute a uh, cryptographic operation to decrypt some data stored on the card. Uh, stored value cards in particular and bus cards do this, and they can make an entire transaction in 200 milliseconds. So one-fifth of a second. You can tap this. It will get enough power to run an operation and shut down very quickly. Oyster card, snapper card, um, octopus card, all of these use induction. Electromagnetic um, generator, the reverse of a motor, uh, you turn something and you get power. Uh, this is a really cool electromagnetic, electromagnetic but also electromechanical generator called a um, gravity light. And the gravity light hangs from the ceiling. And this cable at one end, you put a bag of rocks in it. And you lift the bag of rocks as high up as you can. And very, very slowly it goes down and it spins a generator inside of here, and this is a light, and so it shines an LED. If you want two hours worth of light in your uh, house that has no electricity, lift a bag of rocks, and it silently 
lowers the bag and runs an electromagnetic generator in there and gives you light and saves you kerosene, saves you from burning things to uh, light your house. Microhydro. Um, Microhydro, of course, um, uses an electromagnetic generator um, using water. And we saw that flow meter before. Well, in this case, we've just got something spinning that's generating electricity. This can be viable for a water pipe that is this big around. You do not need much in the way of flow. You don't need much in the way of um, money to make this happen. You can buy a very small microhydro in the tens of dollars, enough to power sensors. You can buy a bigger one for, say, $1,000 that's good enough to power a house or a refrigerator. Um, great application of microhydro. There's a man and a company in New Zealand now that has been using washing machine motors, Fisher and Paykel washing machine motors for microhydro installations that you can find in uh, particular in uh, Himalayan countries like Nepal. Piezoelectric. Piezo is really cool because it's both an actuator, you know, like that buzzer, and um, a, uh, an electrical generation facility. You've got two effects. If you put electricity through these two wires, this thing's going to vibrate. And on the other hand, if you vibrate this thing, it's going to put electricity through. Thermoelectric. This is a Peltier. So it um, generates electricity based on the difference between the hot side and the cold side. But just like a piezo, if you put electricity through it, one side gets hot, the other side gets cold. I, I have no idea how this works. It's magic. But for the longest time, I've had a little cooler that goes in the back of my car um, that plugs into the cigarette lighter. And that thing is a, a, a Peltier-based thermoelectric cooler. Now, there is a real use of thermoelectric for charging devices. This is the BioLite. It's now about five years old. I would call this a robust technology with a couple of sticks, seriously, just a handful of sticks and a match, you can charge a cell phone. And that is entirely based on Peltier. This, this is a um, heat sink in here. So there's a heat sink and some sort of a fan to cool the, um, uh, to cool the heat sink off. And then the hot side is here where you're, you're getting the, the energy. And solar, of course, the most simple, um, just gives you voltage as long as it's clean. Solar-powered streetlights are everywhere, including the Pacific. When I was in Tahiti, I noticed there were solar-powered streetlights from a Chinese company just all over the place. OK, IoT, generating electricity, storing electricity. Storing electricity is hard, and you have a lot of choices. You can have one use or renewable storage. Um, your storage can vary vastly in terms of its capacity. It can vary vastly in terms of its lifetime in years or days or weeks or the amount of charge cycles it can have. I've now learned that um, cell phone batteries are good for like 500 full charge cycles before they start being unhappy. And Apple computer batteries, they really don't want you to charge them more than a 1,000 times. Um, my five-year-old MacBook has seriously swollen batteries. You can't set it down on a desk anymore. Um, and I just don't have an extra $6,000 to buy a new one right now. So eventually, it'll just explode on me. <laughs> you have problems with, uh, you have issues to consider with how much current. Some power storage is good for lots and lots of electricity delivered very, very slowly. Some is good for lots and lots of electricity delivered very quickly. Physical size can vary, of course, from the size of a fingernail to the size of this room or more. Um, and environmental impact. Um, lithium, which is the heart of uh, most of our batteries these days, is a non-renewable and deplenishing resource. And that's why the most expensive part of a water meter, uh, especially the water meters they're using in Australia, the most expensive part of the meter is the battery itself not the electronics, not the radio. 
So alkaline batteries uh, used to be they had a horrible environmental impact because they had cadmium and lead in them. These days, alkaline batteries are disposable and relatively safe, but you are throwing away metal, and that's not a great idea. Lead acid batteries are nearly infinitely recyclable. Recyclable. When they wear down, you send them back. The lead gets used 100%. Lead acid batteries are the heart of most telco systems and um, industrial moving vehicles. Now that we have... Uh, Consumer moving vehicles like electric cars, these are mostly lithium ion batteries, but if you're talking about an electric forklift uh, or an electric boat, these are typically using lead acid batteries. Lithium batteries. So this is a one use, what we call a primary cell lithium battery. You can get these to run for 10 years. These are not rechargeable. This is a lithium ion battery. You can get these uh, and charge them up 300 times, 1,000 times before they die. They will lose capacity reliably every month, a couple of percent of their capacity if you're not charging them. Uh, and they, will, they have a lifetime, um, ticking clock. But the heart of most of what we do. I'm sure this microphone has a lithium ion battery in it. Certainly all of our phones and our laptops do. Supercapacitors and ultracapacitors are really, really cool devices that have a nearly infinite charge cycle. You can charge them up thousands or tens of thousands of times. They're very good at delivering power very quickly. They're also very, very big and expensive for the amount of power they store. Uh, if we go back one step and we look at this battery right here, storing that much energy in a ultra capacitor, you would need something the size of an orange or a grapefruit. And well, this battery might cost you $10, the ultra capacitor the size of a grapefruit might cost you 300. Why would you ever use a super capacitor or an ultra capacitor? Number one, they can charge up or deliver their power almost instantly. Number two, they have a much better temperature range than lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion and lead acid batteries in particular hate being very, very hot. So there is a uh, guy I know based in Sweden who has a bunch of weather stations in Africa. And these weather station enclosures will get up to 60 or 70 degrees because the outside temperature will get up to 50 degrees and they're in the sun. So he had to stop using traditional batteries and start using ultra capacitors to collect energy and run his weather stations. That's the end of the, um, it's hard to fit all this in 90 minutes, eh? How much time? We've got 20 minutes left. Perfect. We're going to talk about radio frequency protocols because the main advances in the IoT have to do with sensors, power collection, power storage, and now using as little energy as possible to send our messages through the air. So again, the constraints we mentioned before, low power, low CPU, small size. We have network constraints like radio propagation issues. When you have a water meter that is in an alley or say below ground, it's really hard to get signal. You know how, how poorly cell phone signal works when you're in a garage. Um, same problem with IoT. Radio power utilization. Cell phones use heaps of power just to send the first byte of data. And in IoT networks, which a lot of times run in shared radio spectrum, ISM band spectrum, uh, you can have issues with interference from your own network or interference from other devices. Uh, I'm listing Wi-Fi because, and I sigh, it is pervasive and it is absolutely the lowest cost. You, when I wrote this, you could get a microprocessor and a Wi-Fi module together in the same package for $7 each US. I think that number has dropped uh, again. I think you can probably get them for like $3 each, especially if you're going to buy 10,000. Um, Wi-Fi is the default protocol for connected devices. And if I'm being pedantic when talking about IoT, I will consider connected devices to be separate from IoT, but whatever. You know, you never, people are going to call it IoT. Where there's power available, Wi-Fi does work. 
but it doesn't solve many IoT problems. And think about Wi-Fi. Every time you go to a different Wi-Fi network, you need to put a different network key and a different SSID and username. Wi-Fi protocols are rapidly becoming insecure. WPA2, the protocol that most of us use, is now crackable very easily. Um, a lot of IoT devices don't even have support for that. Wi-Fi doesn't solve the power problem. It doesn't solve a mobility problem. It doesn't solve a distance problem. But if it's a connected device in a home or a business and there's Wi-Fi access, it is the default. 802.15 series includes, this is IEEE standard, so kind of like uh, Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Uh, it's another 802 standard. Zigbee, Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy can run at 868 megahertz and 915 megahertz. This is important because radio waves below one gigahertz propagate very well. Radio waves two gigahertz and above do not propagate very well. Wi-Fi sometimes doesn't work through a single wall. Uh, 868 or 915 can work a very long way. In New Zealand, our LoRaWAN network at 868 megahertz reliably works at 50 kilometers away with line of sight. The 802 series protocols are good for about 20 kilobits per second to one megabit per second. Our Wi-Fi, conference Wi-Fi now is running at around 300 megabits per second. So big difference, orders of magnitude different uh, for the um, capacity. Zigbee uh, or 802 protocols, 15 protocols, can be a star topology where you've got a single tower and a lot of um, subscribers to that tower, or a tree uh, so that you have a set uh, of stars, or a mesh topology where units can both be transmitters and receivers and can pass on signal from one to the next to the next. Uh, I find that a very inefficient um, way of doing things because Mesh nodes that want to repeat a signal need to be awake and listening to other nodes in their network all of the time, and that's very energy intensive. Typically, 802.15 protocols are low power consumption. When they're in the 2.4 gigahertz band, they are very low cost. They do have encryption available. And if you're an academic, Ulrich was mentioning that he, he didn't want to hear from any academic studying IoT because none of what they're doing is practical. And it is true. But if you're an academic and you want to simulate 802.15, there are a bunch of network simulators that will show you how a network hangs together. OK. If you order something off of, oh, man. There's, there's some um, Chinese shopping um, website that's not AliExpress that, that Matt was telling me about yesterday. Taobao? Ta 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 Yes, if you order something off of Taobao um, for a garage door opener or a um, water tank monitor or something that's very inexpensive that has some wireless component to it, often what's happening is you're getting an RMF69 chip, which costs like 50 cents, and it allows you to send serial data through the air, um, very long distances, very low bit rates, um, usually without encryption, but with some encryption support. Um, yeah, I say 350 per module. That means a module with a CPU, inputs, outputs, and a radio transmitter. Um, it's cheaper than that now. But um, not good. There's, there's no ecosystem. It, it's a way of making a one-off system that will work in one place and has no scalability. Um, so don't, don't do it. It's not, it's not IoT. I'm going to skip Dash 7 because it basically doesn't exist anymore. The US military bought everything and didn't make it for anyone else ever again. Um, Z-Wave, again, I'm going to skip. Sigfox is interesting. Sigfox is one of one, two, three, four protocols that I would consider to be um, mature IoT protocols today. And uh, it's a really weird situation because Sigfox is a company in France that invented their own standard, and they are a network operator. And they're a network operator with global networks now. They probably have networks in 30 or 40 countries. They go in and partner with a company in a country. In New Zealand, that company is Cordia, our state-owned broadcaster. And they say, Cordia, we want you to run our Sigfox network. You're going to take a percentage of the revenues. Um, we're going to give you the base stations. 
Uh, we're going to continue owning the base stations. We're going to own all of the intellectual property and all of the network data. You're just going to put up base stations and fix them when they break. You're going to sell stuff to our, you know, our joint customers too. Uh, Sigfox originally was a transmit-only network. So a device like this clicker, this clicker is a transmit-only. All this clicker does is send a message, says go forward, go back. It doesn't ever receive messages. Transmit-only is great for meters. Sigfox's customers found that, ah, uh, yeah, that's not going to work. Nobody really wanted a transmit only, especially because IoT devices are prone to vulnerabilities. And when you put a transmit device only device in the field, if you want to change the software on it, you need to go in person. So they have uh, changed their protocols uh, and devices so they're bidirectional. Sigfox is very slow and very robust and very reliable. They have limitations of sending up to 140 messages a day, and the messages are 12 bytes. 12 bytes, not like 12 kilobytes or 12 megabytes, but 12 bytes. Tiny, tiny messages. In the end, that, tr that translates to anywhere between 10 and 1,000 bits per second coming from a device going to the internet. Um, how, this is like f six orders of magnitude slower than Wi-Fi. It's just unimaginable. Uh, yes, they have some sort of encryption that I don't understand because it's proprietary. Uh, and their target pricing for devices, they want to be able to sell IoT connectivity globally for a dollar per device per year. That's their business model. That's what they're working towards. And I wouldn't be surprised if they get there within five years. Next up, we have Laura. And do we go to Laura Wan also? or I just talk about LoRa. Now, I just do talk about LoRa. LoRa is a radio protocol, uh, low power, wide area network, designed for wireless battery operated devices. Um, I should really be calling this LoRa WAN. LoRa is the radio protocol, and LoRa WAN is an IoT network protocol. Supports bidirectional communications, mobility, localization. Mobility means you can join a device to the network in one place, and then you can go to another base station. Um, when you move from one base station to the other, the network automatically knows that you've moved, automatically routes messages destined to you into the correct base station so that you get them. Uh, 0.3 to 50 kilobits per second. I should knock this off because very few people run LoRaWAN networks that can do 50 kilobits per second. Um, for the most part, LoRaWAN networks are 0.3 kilobits to about 6 or 8 kilobits per second. LoRaWAN is super cool because it has multiple levels of encryption. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a network operator and radio operator for a LoRaWAN network. I never see what's in the payload of the applications of the users of my network. Never. I don't have the keys to decrypt their data. I can see the metadata, but no one else can, because over the air, all anybody sees is a very faint packet that is, if they could catch it, they would have to decrypt it, and they, they would have to have a set of network keys to do that. Uh, LoRaWAN schedule, uh, supports time slot scheduling. Uh, I have an hour-long talk just on how LoRaWAN works, so we'll, if you really want that, then talk to me later. <laughs> Waitlist. Waitlist was um, one of the things that I got into several years ago in 2011, 2012 that ended up failing. It ended up failing because the only company making a waitlist chipset was purchased by Huawei. And Huawei has taken that intellectual property and pushed it into the 3GPP stream of cellular protocols. They're now calling it narrowband IoT. Narrowband IoT integrates with cellular. Uh, using re-farmed GSM spectrum. So at the moment, when cellular carriers put up an LTE base station, they're going to have a, a channel that's maybe 3 or 4 megahertz. And then on the sides of that, they may be still running some 2G so that you can do your voice and text messages and GPRS data. Well, when they start turning off those 2G services, they can reuse those bits of spectrum for narrowband IoT. Just like LoRaWAN, designed for low power consumption. The protocol allows coordination between nodes and base stations. 
the node can tell the base station, hey, I'm going to go to sleep, and I'm going to wake up again in three days. I'm going to want to transmit really fast. Can you reserve a slot for me in three days? That can happen with narrowband IoT. Uh, narrowband IoT allows for much faster data rates than LoRaWAN. It can go up to megabits per second, depending upon the channel size. Most uses are going to be bits or kilobits per second. Uh, intelligent scheduling, public key encryption, um, supports itinerant nodes or nomadic nodes uh, that move from one place to the other. Almost done. This is uh, also called CAT M1, um, LTE MTC or LTE IoT, machine type communications. Oh, good, it does say CAT M1 here. Um, it is now in live in cellular networks. Uh, it was included in 3GPP release 13. Um, it uses existing LTE base stations. Uh, it uses channels that could be on the side of the main LTE data channels. It is a very, very good protocol for Coke machines, street lights, buses, any device that needs to send data that was using 3G data or 4G data, LTE MTC allows that device to communicate with much less battery use, higher, uh, faster transmissions, more robust transmissions. It is designed for IoT. 3G and 4G were never designed for IoT. They were designed for broadband data to your phone. Uh, LTMTC is the first cellular protocol really designed for machine-to-machine -machine communication. And, oh boy, OK. Uh, yeah, OK, I talk about Laura Wan. Bunch of software things that go on with the web, web sockets. MQTT is a really cool protocol where you have the idea of publishing and subscribing. So I'm a sensor. I'm going to send a stream of data to a broker. That broker is going to allow multiple applications or users to subscribe to my set of messages. Uh, MQTT is an ISO, IEC standard, uh, very popular and useful in wireless sensor networks. Now a bunch of platforms. There are platforms that allow you to take any of the technologies that I spoke about, any of the sensors, any of the batteries, any of the radio protocols, and gather this information into a big data platform that allows you to store it, send it on, mash it up, serve it up. Some of those platforms are PubNub, Microsoft Azure, uh, Iron, IO, which is uh, uh, MQTT based, they have an Iron MQ. Uh, IBM's Bluemix, Amazon AWS IoT. Amazon now has an MQTT broker that runs just like their relational database service. So you can spin up an instance of Amazon uh, MQTT, which I haven't done yet, but I'm super keen to do it. Uh, all things talk. My, Cayenne My Devices. Cayenne My Devices is great because they have a set of hundreds of sensors and platforms that they know about already. And when you connect one of those sensors or platforms, they'll draw the graphs for you. So they've got dashboards. You can connect a device and get data on a dashboard within 10 minutes. And I do this as an exercise in my hands-on uh, uh, IoT LoRaWAN workshop. We, we put devices into uh, my devices, just really cool. I worry about them, they haven't figured out a good pricing model yet, so everything's still free. And I always worry when companies give things away for free that they won't exist in another year. Uh, stream Technologies, IoTX, uh, Digi. Digi is an industrial device maker. They make devices and they have their own platform that exists just for their devices. The nice thing about the Digi platform is that they're APIs so that if you want to pull your data from Digi's platform into another platform, you can do that pretty easily. Um, I have some